If you would turn your Bibles to Revelation chapter 1, we will resume our study in that book, and we were looking down through about verse uh, 13 or so last time. Remember in chapter 1 we had our uh, introduction to Jesus, the letter comes through John, but from Jesus, and he was introduced in the early part of the first chapter as the one who has overcome, he has overcome death and his enemies. He has made his people to overcome. He has made them to be a kingdom and priests. And uh, he is the one who will overcome. He is coming on the clouds against Rome and is going to judge this enemy of God's people. And so John then tells us about his own personal circumstances, that he has uh, been exiled on the island of Patmos for the testimony uh, of the Lord. And in this mode, he then begins to hear a voice that says, write what you see, and no sooner is he told to write what he sees than he begins to see, in verse 12, the one who is speaking with him, the one who is in the midst of seven golden lampstands, and uh, we began to notice the description of Jesus uh, in verse 12, that he... uh, uh, the way he is described there... uh, Verse uh, 12, he is clothed with a robe or in a robe, reaching to the feet and girded across his chest with a golden sash. And of course, to a Jew, you know exactly what that means, that he is dressed in a priestly kind of robe. And the imagery there uh, seems to come from Daniel chapters 7 and 10, where a lot of these things are drawn from. In Daniel 7 and verse 9, I kept looking until thrones were set up, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His vesture was like white snow, the head of his hair was like pure wool. His throne was ablaze with flames, its wheels were a burning fire. A river of fire was flowing and coming out from before him. Thousands upon thousands were attending him, myriads upon myriads standing before him. The courts sat and the books were opened. So this this picture of Jesus in uh, white this uh, beautiful robe uh, and the white around him and the golden sash. Uh, Also in Daniel 10 and verse 6, his body was like beryl, his face had the appearance of lightning, his eyes were like flaming torches, his arms and feet like the gleam of polished bronze, the sound of his words like the sound of a tumult. Lots of those phrases from Daniel 7 and 10 are going to appear in this description. And so he is described here, first of all, as kingly and priestly. And remember, one of the jobs of the priests was to tend the lampstands in the temple. And so here is Jesus among the lampstands. You might want to think about the image in Ephesians 2, that we are growing into a holy temple in the Lord. And that is the kind of picture that we have here, that God's people are his temple. In the midst of it are these symbolic representations of them, the lampstands, Jesus, as the great high priest, is tending them and is among them. Uh, It says also there in uh, verse 14 that his head and his hair were white as wool. And so we just noted the passage in Daniel 7 where the Ancient of Days, God himself, is described as having hair like pure wool. And his eyes are like fire. Daniel 10 and verse 6, the vision there Uh, that Daniel says is that his eyes were like flaming torches. And we don't have to go too far into this description until we begin to understand very clearly that Jesus is being described like God. John is using language that is used of God in the Old Testament to describe Jesus. And there are uh, a couple things perhaps significant about that, but the thing that is certainly significant is that Jesus is the equal of God. And so the Jesus that we were introduced to in the first part of the chapter, the one who has overcome, who has made his people overcome, and who is going to overcome the Roman uh, Empire and its evil, is no less than the equal of God himself. And there is no reason, therefore, for any of these people to worry about how this is going to come out or if the outcome will be uh, what they hope. This is one who has the attributes of God himself that is among them. Uh, Verse 15, his feet were like burnished bronze. 
Uh, in Daniel chapter 10 and verse 6, we find this as well. His feet and his arms are like the gleam of polished bronze. And there, of course, uh, in that context, it is a context of God being described as strong. Uh, arms and feet like bronze, the idea of something that is uh, sturdy and hard and the material of which weapons are made. And in that context, of course, God is coming out to do battle, and so we here see Jesus described in that same kind of way. Uh, there is some question, though, about exactly the, the point of it being burnished. Does that mean that it is pure, uh, no flaw in it, or does that mean that it has been hardened, and uh, nobody seems to know exactly the point of saying that it was burnished, but it is probably just to say that it was not just ordinary bronze, but the best quality. Uh, he is most fit for what he does. Uh, there's also a suggestion that burnished means that it has been about the fire. Uh, in Daniel chapter 3, uh, we get that same kind of uh, uh, image involved there. And so some have suggested that this is burnished or heated bronze because Jesus has been through the fire of persecution himself and bears the marks. We're going to see later on that the, Jesus is sometimes described as bearing the marks of his warfare and his suffering. So there might be a little puzzle about uh, why it is burnished, but it seems to just simply bolster the image that we are given here. Um, Verse 15, his voice was like the sound of many waters. And this is uh, quite common in the Old Testament as well to describe the voice of God. We heard just a moment ago in Daniel 10 and verse 6 that the sound of his words were like the sound of a tumult. Anybody know what a tumult is? An uproar or a battle. So the noisiness, the loud sound that God's voice has that loud kind of sound to it. In Ezekiel 1, I heard the sound of their wings and the sound of abundant waters as they went like the voice of the Almighty. And so the picture that is that uh, God's voice is a loud voice. Ezekiel goes on to say, a sound of a tumult like an army camp. Uh, and then in Ezekiel 43, behold, the glory of the God of Israel was coming from the way of the east his voice was like the sound of many waters, and the earth shone with his glory. If you've ever been to a place where there's a large waterfall, Cumberland Falls, Niagara Falls, or something like that, you know that the sound of water can be almost deafening when there's enough of it. And that's the picture of God here, the sound of tremendous volume to his voice, uh, expansive and authoritative. And again, the point is that this is how God is typically described, but here it is the Lord Jesus carrying those same uh, characteristics. And then this one who is described as God in every uh, piece of his appearance, it says of him in verse 15 that in his hand he held seven stars. Back in chapter, or down in chapter 1 and verse 20, we find out, uh, what all of these things are. As for the mystery of the seven stars and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. Uh, kind of like the heavenly man that is described in Daniel 12. Uh, there, the overseer, the protector of God's people. The Jews believe that God had put angels in charge of protecting his people and so we see that kind of thing going on here, that, that there are uh, behind the scenes these divine beings in the plan of God behind the people of God. Uh, in Daniel 12 and verse 3, uh, we also have that those who have insight will shine brightly like the brightness of the expanse of heaven, and those who lead the many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. And so the people of God in Daniel chapter 3 are compared to the brightness of the stars and uh, brilliant, beautiful things. And in Daniel 12 there, it is those who have been raised to glory. Now, however you want to take that passage, it is one of the most powerful resurrection texts in all the Old Testament. And the description of those who are raised is that they are like stars. And so 
Uh, the imagery is a little confusing to us. Maybe we know how are they angels? Are they people? It is a representation of how God sees his people, both from the heavenly and the earthly realms, that they are in his hand, as it were, and he is in control. So the picture is, uh, is a very powerful one uh, that paints this tremendous picture of Jesus in the strength of God. Um, verse uh, 16, to continue, out of his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword. And again, this is something that we find uh, describing God in the Old Testament in Isaiah 11. With righteousness he will judge the poor and decide with fairness for the afflicted of the earth, and he will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he will slay the wicked. So this idea that judgment comes out of the mouth of God. And of course that is a metaphor for God's word of judgment that brings about the judgment. But when God speaks... It falls, the, the nation falls, and so it is like him having a rod. In Isaiah 49, the Lord called me from the womb, from the body of my mother. He named me. He has made my mouth like a sharp sword in the shadow of his hand. He has concealed me. He has made me a select arrow. He has hidden me in his quiver. And so there the Messiah is described as having a mouth like a sharp sword. He is prepared uh, he is the instrument of God's vengeance. He is the sword, he is the arrow, as it were, that God will use against the enemy. And, of course, uh, we'll see this later on in Revelation 19 and verse 15. This image comes back to us in the context of Jesus judging this enemy. So it's fairly common. And, of course, it would have been very common to the uh, readers of John's day as well because they all understood that a sword was the common uh, equipment of any Roman soldier. And so Jesus is prepared for war. He is decked out in the glory and the attributes of God. He holds the stars in his hand. That is, he has the control over his people. He can protect them, and yet he can also crush them, as it were. And he has the ability to make war with the enemy. And then finally, we are told about him in verse 16 that his face was like the sun shining in its strength, which is, again, one of these descriptions from the Old Testament. Um, Daniel 10, verse 5. I lifted my eyes and looked, and behold, there was a certain man dressed in linen whose waist was girded with a belt of pure gold. We just saw that a moment ago in the uh, description here. His body was like beryl, his face had the appearance of lightning, his eyes were like flaming torches, his arms and feet like the gleam of polished bronze, and the sound of his words like that of a tumult. And so this idea of his appearance had the appearance of lightning. Here we have this brilliant visage. And in Judges 5, 31, Let all your enemies perish, O Lord, but let those who love him be like the rising of the sun in its might. And so it is also used of the people of God, and we should not be surprised to see that in the description of Jesus as well, that he is the faithful one, he has risen in glory, and therefore he uh, stands ready to fight. Well, John says in verse 17 that when I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man. I guess I would have too, you would have too. And he placed his right hand on me, saying, do not be afraid, I am the first and the last. So there is more language describing him. We heard him called Alpha and Omega at the beginning part of chapter 1. This is a similar phrase. The Alpha is the first letter of the Greek alphabet. Omega is the last. And to say that I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, means that I'm the beginning, the end, I'm everything in between, that it is all wrapped up in me, that he has control over it all. It's not like the kings of the earth who have a small portion of this world to reign over and they reign over it for a short time and then they're gone. Jesus says, I'm the first and the last. It's all under mine, that I am over all of it. And so uh, this divine sovereignty over history is something that is mentioned uh, in connection with God when his people were in times of trouble. You recall the passages here in Isaiah, Isaiah 41, 44, and 48 
are all times that Isaiah was addressing the people in captivity. Uh, Isaiah 41, 4, who has performed and accomplished it, calling forth the generations from the beginning? I, the Lord, am the first, and with the last I am he. And so God is comforting his people there, saying, this is not the end of you, that I am in control of this situation. I'm the first and the last. Isaiah 44, 6, thus says the Lord, the King of Israel and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last, and there is no God besides me. And so we see this kind of epithet uh, of God. But the the voice also says uh, to John that uh, I am the first and the last and the living one. Now, of course, the living one is a description of God in the Old Testament. Deuteronomy 32, 40. Indeed, I lift up my hand to heaven and say, as I live forever. And remember, Daniel, the context there is the people in captivity as well, and God uh, is recognized by even the foreign king as the true living God there. And so Jesus is here, again, giving titles of himself that reassures his people of his power. And not only that, uh, as to nail it down, verse 18, I was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. I have the keys of death and of Hades. And so Jesus may have appeared to have been defeated by the Romans when they crucified him, But the fact is that he now reigns over them, that this is not any weakness on his part. He is alive forevermore. We mentioned in one of our introductory classes this myth, this story that was going around in the first century that Nero had come back from the dead, this thing called the Nero Redivivus myth. And you can't help but hear an echo of that here, that Jesus says, no, I'm really the one that has come back from the dead. Forget about the emperor. There is no other Nero that's come back to reign over the world. I'm the one that is over all. We're going to see a lot of that in the book where uh, Jesus and John are going to use the imperial language of Jesus himself. He has the keys of death and of Hades, we are told. And again, this is something that is uh, told to us in the Old Testament in some highly symbolic language there in Isaiah chapter 22. The new king that is coming, Eliakim, God says, I will clothe him. He will become a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, to the house of Judah. Then I will set the key of the house of David on his shoulder. When he opens, no one will shut. When he shuts, no one will open. He, I will drive him like a peg in a firm place. He will become a throne of glory to his father's house. And so this idea that he has the keys, that he has the authority uh, to rule uh, is emphasized here as well. So this is the, the one that is now going to be in charge. We've been introduced to Jesus in this first vision. And from there, John is told, therefore, write the things which you've seen, the things which are, the things which will take place after these. As for the mystery, we have the explanation in verse 20 about the lampstands and the stars, that they are the angels and the churches. Uh, A couple of things about the letters before we look at them in particular. Uh, Each one of them starts the words of the Lord Uh, Thus says the Lord. Uh, It doesn't come out that way in English all the time. Like in the New American Standard, in chapter 2, verse 1, it it says, says this, which kind of robs it of its power and its punch. In Greek, it is the phrase that an emperor would use to preface his own remarks. Thus says the emperor. And people in the first century would have picked up on that right away, that these are imperial edicts from the true ruler of the world. The letters connect the spiritual and the historical conditions of the churches. Uh, Each letter has something mentioned in it that would have been peculiar and readily understandable to the people in that particular place because it was part of their culture and making some kind of spiritual point about it. 
But all of these letters have to do with being faithful in a world that is hostile to God. And they all follow the same kind of form, uh, seven parts. There is a command to write to the angel of the church and -and so-and-so, write. And then it starts with a description of Jesus. And every one of those descriptions will be taken from the list we just looked at. All those Old Testament descriptions come back in these letters. If the Lord has anything good to say to the church, he'll say it. If he has anything negative to say, he'll say it then. He will then rebuke them and warn them. Because remember, that's what this is all about. That God is going to come in judgment. The Lord Jesus, who reigns over the nations, is going to destroy this wicked empire And if you're dallying around in it and participating in its evil, you're going to get destroyed too. And so if they are not being faithful, the Lord rebukes them and warns them. The letters end then with a call to hear. He who has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will do so and so. And there will be a promise that will uh, kind of whet our appetite for the final glory that is to come. So with that in mind then, uh, let's look at the letter to Ephesus, chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, the one who walks among the seven golden lampstands, says this, I know your deeds and your toil and your perseverance, and that you cannot tolerate evil men. You put to test those who call themselves apostles, and they are not You found them to be false, and you have perseverance and have endured for my name's sake and have not grown weary. We probably know more about the church in Ephesus than we do any other church in the New Testament. We can read in the book of Acts how the church started. We know the names of the people who first preached in Ephesus. There is uh, uh, Paul and Aquila and Priscilla and Apollos and people like that all associated with it. And then there's the letter to the Ephesians that probably wasn't written only to them, but was included, uh, they were included among the recipients, that gives us some sense of uh, their position. And then we have uh, this uh, picture here at the end of the book of Revelation. The church in Ephesus would have been started at about what year? 50s A.D., somewhere in the early 50s A.D. Book of Revelation is written in about 95, 96. And so we have here kind of a 45-year history of this church. We probably know more about the condition of this church than any other one. 45 years is enough to have maybe two or three generations of Christians in it. And so when the Lord says, I know your toil and your perseverance, uh, that's a good thing. They have been fighting the good fight for a long time. And uh, false apostles have been about. Paul talks about that in his letters to Timothy, about how false teachers, false apostles are going to come. And the church at Ephesus was listening. Remember in Acts 20, Paul told the elders of the church at Ephesus that among your own selves, wolves will arise and not spare the flock, false teachers teaching perverse things. And so they've been listening. They've been uh, guarding the flock as Paul told them to do. And uh, Paul says, or the Lord says to them here that uh, you've been doing well with that. Uh, It's interesting when you look at that. Uh, The Lord doesn't say, you know, you've tripled in your membership in the last 20 years. He doesn't say that uh, you've been supporting gospel preachers in 15 different countries over the last 30 years. Some of the things that we would use as barometers of success aren't even on this letter. What the Lord says is you've persevered, you've kept the faith. And there's something significant about that, that that's what's important to the Lord. That's first on his list. Those, that's good, but he says, I have this against you, verse 4, uh, that you have left your first love. And you read that and you think, oh goodness, what a problem that is. It's good to say we're faithful, but faithful isn't enough. It's good to say, you know what, we're, we're making sure that the truth is taught and, and we're listening to the truth and we're making sure that we practice only what the pattern is in the New Testament, but that's not enough because it has to be done out of love for the Lord. And if we do those things but we don't love the Lord, we're just doing it because that's what we do or it's tradition or because we've always done it that way, 
the Lord says to the church at Ephesus, you, you've lost your love for me. And that makes all the difference. And so you're going to have to fix that, the Lord says. Remember from where you've fallen. Uh, that's a powerful message when you just think about it. That without love for the Lord, none of these other things are really significant. They're, you know, we're not going to impress Jesus with our faithfulness that lacks love. It just doesn't happen. And so remember from where you've fallen, repent and do what you did at first. Demonstrate your love the way you used to, or else I'm coming to you and uh, will remove your lampstand. However, Jesus says, there is one more good thing in verse 6. This you do have that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans. Nobody knows exactly who these Nicolaitans are. It's likely that this is a symbolic name. The word Nicolaitan means conqueror of people. And it may be kind of a code word for false apostles, false teachers, in other words, that the Lord is saying, now I know you've been faithful. There have those, been those who would try to conquer you, and you haven't let them do that. But the fact is you've still lost your first love. The problem is that some specific group seems to be indicated. In chapter 2 and verse um, 15, the church at Pergamum is having a problem with the teaching of the Nicolaitans. So it sounds like a particular group who they were is impossible to say. There is no historical record of any group called the Nicolaitans. Uh, and this gave rise to all kinds of speculation among the ancients as to who they might be, but we simply don't know. What we do know, maybe with some confidence, is that they apparently taught some kind of compromise between Christianity and paganism. That seems to be the idea in the letter to Pergamum that there has been some sacrificing to pagan gods of some kind that involved a compromise with paganism. So was Ephesus involved in that? It certainly would not be out of place for that to be a problem in a place like Ephesus. Uh, but whatever uh, those people are, the Lord tells them that you're going to have to repent. And I've always found it interesting that of these seven churches, more than half of them are told that they need to repent. It's kind of interesting. We go along our merry little way, and we think everything's fine. You know, we're doing well. Uh, the church is in good shape. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. The Lord looks at it and says, I've got a problem with this. And things on the outside might look well, but on the inside they might not be what they ought to be. And so these letters always present for us uh, an opportunity to reflect upon our own uh, spirituality. <laughs> The Lord says, he who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God, which Brother Dickey mentioned in his class on Sunday morning. Uh, paradise, as Brother Dickey uh, mentioned uh, as well, is a park. It's a Persian word, actually, that comes into the Hebrew language. It means park or grove of trees. And that's why the Garden of Eden was called paradise, because it was a park or a grove of trees. And we look at that and we say, well, that image is pretty self-explanatory. Jesus is going to allow us to be in heaven if we overcome and eat of the tree of life. But I want to suggest to you that that image would have meant something special to the people of Ephesus. Remember back in one of our introductory uh, classes, we talked about the Temple of Artemis at Ephesus and how big it was. It was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. And it was built on a site in Ephesus that was believed to have been a sacred grove of trees. And so when Jesus says to them, I will give you to eat of the tree in the special grove of God, the, the trees of God, well, the Ephesians knew exactly about a holy place in the middle of trees. Uh, and also, uh, the temple in the ancient Greek world was a sacred precinct, and you could find asylum there. You could go and grab onto the altar uh, at the temple and claim asylum. You would be immune from prosecution. And usually that asylum extended for 
so many blocks around a temple. So if you stayed in the area of the temple, uh, you were immune from whatever punishment somebody wanted to inflict upon you. So there is this idea of security. You go to the place of the sacred grove here where God is, and there you will find safety from the rest of the world. The ancient Ephesians would have understood that. This is a coin from the city of Ephesus. It was minted in Ephesus uh, among the Ephesians. The uh, stag, the deer, is one of the symbols of Artemis, but you'll notice the tree on the coin because the tree, uh, the sacred tree, is very important to Artemis as well. This is where that great temple of Artemis originally stood, and even today it is a place that is full of trees. Uh, there's uh, kind of what the floor plan looked like, some of the foundations and a kind of a view looking toward the end of it there with some people to get some scale. But again, the trees around, a sacred place where God is. And so the Ephesians, I think, would have understood uh, maybe a little special thing about that point there. Well, thank you for your good uh, participation tonight. My goal next week is to get through the other six letters. Yeah, that's a good one, isn't it? <laughs> but we're going to try. So thanks for your participation tonight.